the technical part of this webinar is sometimes <laughs> the most difficult one. But I think we're here now. So um, thanks a lot for joining everybody. Uh, and I'm happy to give the floor to Brecht. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Lara. So we will uh, kick off and give yeah, people some time to, uh, to keep joining uh, the webinar. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, heli conference webinar uh, focusing on the gender disparities during the COVID um, crisis and the aftermath of the crisis. Uh, my name is Brecht de Vleeschauer and it's indeed my pleasure to welcome you all here and to introduce the context and the program of today's webinar. Um, the current webinar is organized within the context of the Helicon project, um, as you will see on the next slide, uh, which is supported by BELSPO through the Belgian research actions through interdisciplinary networks. Um, Laura, if you can move to the next slide. Um, the project is a collaboration between Cienciano and different Belgian universities, the Vrije Universiteit Brussels, Ghent University, UC Louvain and the KU Leuven. Um, and the project aims to unravel the social inequalities and the long-term and indirect health effects of the COVID crisis in uh, Belgium. Um, on the one hand, within the project, we are generating ourselves new information on these topics, but we also aim to disseminate any relevant insights uh, produced on these topics in the wider Belgian community of science and practice. So that's why we are here today. Um, today's webinar, as mentioned, will focus on the gender disparities during COVID, um, mainly to show that these expand uh, far beyond um, yeah, gender and sex differences in infection rates. Um, we know that scientific evidence indicates that the indirect effects of COVID-19 have disproportionately Im impacted women. We also know that gender intersects with economic, social, environmental and health factors which creates a very complex web of challenges. Through this webinar, we want to explore how these differences manifest across uh, the different facets of the crisis, spanning from the workplace to the home, and most importantly, what we can learn from these insights for future pandemics and future crises. Um, to address these questions, we have invited five leading researchers in the field to uh, discuss the health risks faced by different genders during the pandemic. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, each of them before we then uh, go over to them to start uh, the different presentations. Um, so first we will have um, Charlotte van Neste and Catherine Fallon, um, who will talk about intimate partner violence uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic. Then Lorraine Thiel will talk about um, a gender analysis of the Belgian recovery and resilience plans. Um, to conclude with Federica Rossetti, who will share insights from the European Resistire project on the intersectional approaches to gender inequalities during the pandemic. And to conclude the webinar, we have invited um, Hildegard van der Hove from the Institute for Equality of Women and Men to provide some general closing remarks, some final insights um, on this topic and this webinar. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here, and it's my pleasure to give the microphone over to my colleague, uh, Laura, um, who will introduce our first uh, speaker. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Brich, for this uh, introduction to the webinar series and to today's session. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Charlotte Van Neste and Professor Catherine Fallon. Perhaps they can already start sharing the presentation they want to present today. Um, so, Professor Char Charlotte Van Neste is professor at U Liège. She has a PhD in criminology and is also a senior researcher at the National Institute for Criminalistics and Criminology. She's recently published a very interesting book on the topic of intimate partner violence, and we're very happy to have her here to share her expertise today. She will be giving a joint presentation with her uh, colleague, Professor Catherine Fallon. Uh, Catherine is also a professor at Uliège, and she has a background in biochemical engineering and a, and a PhD in uh, political sciences. She has uh, expertise specifically in the governmentability of intimate partner violence. So we're very happy to have them here today. 
and to learn from their insights in this topic. Catherine or uh, Charlotte, I don't know. Do you, do you see my presentation? No, not yet. So it's on the buttons. Yes, something is happening. Good. Yes, we see the presentation. It just needs to go into presenter mode. Okay. Um, not yet. N now we see it in presenter view. Um, yes. Maybe you need yes. to swap if you would click on parameter d'affichage. Um, it's not. I know. So is it good? No, not yet. Um, Can you try again? What I have to do? So I... There a bit more to the right, if you click on Utiliser le mode présentateur, if you deselect that one. Uh, uh, I lose you. Don't worry, it will all work out. Now we see a black a black screen. I, I lose the screen. Sorry. Don't worry. It's just building anticipation for the presentation. So everything. Yes, but I, I don't find. Uh, I, that's me. Sorry, but I, I I lose the screen. I cannot. Um, wait, perhaps it's an option. Is it the same presentation you sent me prior to? Yes, perhaps I I can share it, and then you just tell me when to click. Is oh that yes, yeah. Okay. Wait. I'm yes. opening it. Okay. <laughs> a backup plan. Okay, so yeah. uh, so in line that? with in line with today's topic, uh, we will briefly report on some results of Bellspo funded research and type IPV to COVID for intimate partner violence during and after COVID. Uh, today we have to limit ourselves to to few points. But the full final report should be available shortly on the Bellspo website. The link is given on the first slide. Uh, I don't, I don't see it. So <laughs> uh, you can go to the second slide. Has the COVID crisis really been a game changer for the IPV phenomenon, of which we know that women are still the main victims? The answer is certainly yes but not in the way that media have mostly suggested, that is in the form of an increase or even an explosion in the number of violent incidents. The answer is much more complex. Two types of quantitative data are currently available in Belgium to explore the question. First, the figures of the number of cases reported to the police and public prosecutor's offices are the most important source of information. However, their interpretation is ambiguous because they reflect a whole series of factors that influence the filing of a complaint or the denunciation of partner violence. They thus reflect the selection of incidents, the tip of the iceberg that are brought to the attention of the justice system. We analyzed uh, statistics of the police areas and statistical and judicial districts taking into account both a long and short term analysis, the classification between physical and psychological violence, and also the well known seasonal effect on the number of incidents of IPV, which is generally higher during the summer vacation and at the end of the year and lower in February, March. We can go to the next slide. Do you see it? I don't hear nobody. Hi. I yes. am showing the next slide with the statistics, the police statistics. Uh, with the graphics. The graphic. 
with the graphs. Okay, uh, you can see the, in the fir, on the first graph on the left that the long term trend in police figures does not support the hypothesis of an increase in IPV reports in 2020. The year 20 is even slightly lower on both curves than the year before and the year after. Then the monthly more detailed analysis then shows that the number of reports in March, April is significantly lower in 2020 than in other years, and that this drop is attributable to reports of psychological rather than physical violence. The next uh, slide. How can this drop be explained? In theory, it could be due to either a drop in the phenomenon or to a drop in the propensity to report. Invoking a decline in the committed violence can be seen as counterintuitive, but we cannot forget that IPV also includes violence against the next partner and that attempts to separate and separation are very often moments that trigger violence. The lockdown could have had the effect on the one hand of postponing separation attempts and on the other of making violence by ex-partner difficult or impossible. Belgian data do not allow us to differentiate these situations, but UK research ver verified, at least in certain police areas, that the fall in violence by ex-partners compensated for the rise in violence by current partners, resulting in a zero effect. The second hypothesis a drop in the tendency to report incidents is likely due to difficulties in accessing police and other services during the lockdown. In addition, the fact that the drop significantly concerns psychological violence and not physical violence could reflect a lesser perception of the need to report or of the urgency of doing so in a social context where survivors' priorities are exacerbated. The next slide. The second type of quantitative data relates to telephone helplines. The figure for the French-speaking line provides information on the evolution in calls relating to IPVs. They show an important peak during the first lockdown. But this short spike in calls was partly due to the increase in calls from victim relatives, from professionals at a stop during the confinement, and from citizens wanting to offer their support and help. Many calls were thus generated by the media coverage of the vulnerability of victims and reflect a form of social solidarity fueled by the awareness rising efforts deployed during the crisis. Then my next slide. To conclude on quantitative data, the Belgian data do not allow us, in line with the international state of art, to deduce that COVID crisis has created a crisis in the number of IPVs. However, the qualitative data we have collected show an impact on the severity and the forms of violence. We cannot detail that, this here and refer to the report. Last but not least, the crisis also had a major impact on policies in the field of IPV and on experiences of professionals. But I now hand over to Professor Catherine Fallon to explain this part of the results. Thank you. Merci, Charlotte. So the idea is that maybe there was not really a much higher, so many higher number of events, which means that these hidden pandemics, which had been presented by Guterres at the start of the crisis, was somehow a phantom or a myth, whatever. But anyway, there was an impact, which means that even it was only due to mediatization, but also to the increase in the calls on the helplines that Charlotte showed, there has been an impact here in Belgium, particularly linked to the political configuration we had at the start of the crisis. Uh, just we had new governments already uh, installed for the regional and com communitarian uh, governments. And the main point was that at the start of the lockdown, we had already a group of, with a 
feminist women politicians in the French speaking part of the country, which were in charge of gender equality, which means they reacted very quickly to this question of risk of higher level of IPVs due to the lockdown. And uh, they decide to finance, give resources to try to alleviate the impact of the lockdown on the IPVs, whether true or not, whatever. But anyway, which means that the policy developed, that, that was uh, the actors themselves, themselves uh, present when they speak about that, they were so lucky to have all women in the ministry. There was a conjunction of stars that had never existed before. And that was very important for the NGO and administration because they can support the uh, policymakers to try to provide a way of acting for policy development to address this issue of increase in IPV, whether real or not. So a, re a visible need was a question of extension of emergency line in both communities, Flemish and, Sp and uh, ne uh, Netherlands. So this uh, was uh, quickly done with the available resources at, at federal level. And then the other uh, issue could came also with ready-made solutions. Somehow the NGOs, which are you know first-line workers particularly for IPV support, uh, they came with the idea of increasing shelters place by using the same dynamic as for people which are living on the street, on the street, SDF people. So they proposed to open hotel. It was particularly well addressed and mediated in Brussels to uh, give a shelter to family and uh, fem um, and women looking for a shelter, but usually if there were, you know, uh, undocumented migrant families uh, or, or women, which means that very, very vulnerable person lower to the usual, you know, level of access for shelters, because you have conditions to access shelters, and those groups were much more vulnerable than the usual target groups. The, the third line we could speak is that the national action plan was addressed uh, recently during the second wave also of the of the COVID crisis, thanks to the same group of feminist uh, uh, ministers. But then the main point was okay, we made policy development, but to address which policy problem? And so, in fact, the silent pandemic was somehow a non-pandemic that was told by many people also working on the police, for example. We say we were waiting for phone calls, we got no phone calls. And so what about the prevalence, as Charlotte said, this is not clear, but other forms of severe IPV maybe or family violence has been reported and are effectively done in the report. So that was somehow, yes, there was a game changer, but you had, we had to analyze on the field what happens by taking another vision than a silent pandemic. Okay, then next slide. Then, in fact, you had to look at other issue, and the other issue was a question of professionals on the street, because those professionals were somehow uh, had to face very uh, different situation. First, these uh, psychosocial workers, which are working mainly in NGO environment, particularly in the French-speaking part of, uh, of Belgium, were considered first as non-vital which means that if they decide to go and support their target group, their usual contacts, they would do that somehow illegally and under tensions. It was only after June that they were uh, recognized as vital uh, for the, as vital groups. And so this, this question for them was very important when you discuss with these uh, workers on, on the field uh, after the, the second wave of COVID, uh, of, uh, they say it was a question of urgency for us, uh, urgency of care. But this level of urgency is in tensions with our usual values. Usually we are not working under pressure of urgency, but we were pushed to do it that way because of mediatization, because of the demand of, uh, of increase in somehow demanding patterns of demand. Some, the, the, when someone was demanding to quit home, it was to be done very quickly and there was no place in the shelters for several reasons. So they were obliged as professionals to not work with a long-term approach, but very short-term response. One person presented himself. I was, you know, working as a in the as a, in a frame of humanitarian aid, you know, uh, soutien humanitaire. 
that is not our usual way of working. It was an experience for us. It was a way, not a way of dealing uh, with this issue, but somehow it's not your, our professional way of acting. And it was really giving us very strong pressure. And so, and at the other side, there was also a transformation of the context and then of the patterns of needs. First, because usually, you know, um, the psychosocial workers are working with a, with several NGOs. It's a network, you know, you also with the police, for example, or for some time uh, GPs. But somehow the networks were, you know, put under pressure. Some part was open, some were closed. In other areas, some professional decide to no go back to not go back to work, even it when it's considered as vital services. So this question of blurred networks was very um, uh, distressing for the person because they had no firm basis as usual. The second point is that they had to meet uh, more vulnerable groups like the ones they put in the, this shelter. Uh, and uh, that was for them more difficult to address. So it's also changed the, the pattern of action while at the same time they had less support from the central NGO. And then the third point, which is coming a lot that everybody knows about that, I think the lockdown rules were really unadapted to the most of the local context they had to cover. It was really a very high issue for all the uh, professionals working by supporting uh, women and family in shelters, where the rules for lockdowns were unbearable for the family, particularly families and children and with children, and then very difficult also for the professionals. As a consequence, during this, uh, this period, as it was really well done in the introduction, we had some form of over solicitation of the profession, not only in the health care, but also for this type of uh, uh, psychosocial uh, professionals. The, the also the, the pressure and also they were feeling as they had less support from the central networks, if were not available, they felt very lonely and they felt that they had no time to give enough support to the people they were contacting and they are speaking about deshumanize, deshumanization of relationships. This is coming a lot. All those elements somehow uh, has been difficult to bear for the people which took uh, on this kind of, uh, you know, of, of work to be done. And then it created a lot of stress after the crisis, because that is the next slide, please. Yes, um, I like the snail of recovery. This is, uh, you know, in the wheat book about the, the white book of uh, reforms in, uh, in, in the pro protection, or protection civile. So the main point is that how do we recover from the crisis? That was also one point I'm making. How do we take care of the carers? So not only at the healthcare system, but also for these professionals, which are, you know, were in the field, which they feel un they felt unprotected. They had to uh, always improvise because the usual networks were not uh, really working. And then after the crisis, once we met, we made several focus groups with this kind of professionals, they say they feel quite irritated. Many of them say we don't want to speak about that anymore. We want to forget everything that happened. We don't want to address this as an issue, which we know, you know, especially in crisis management, that we need to have some form of recovery. We need to speak about it. Otherwise, you could have a longer term trauma as a, a professional. So um, this kind of irritation and anger was very often said and put at the fore. And then one of them said, you know, coming out of the crisis is a crisis for the worker. And we cannot go back to the former state, which means that after the crisis, it takes time for reconstruction and then recovery. What needs to be done, like deb debriefing is usually done, should be done in to improve the situation by thinking about what was done and how we could eventually be prepared for a next type of crisis like this one, which could be another pandemic in five years time. So all this work, it's, it was not done. On, I, we only came across one group where the people were was quite quiet and confident, and they had spent time with the uh, head of their organization to debrief what has been done and to try to be get a prepare for a next uh, type of lockdown. So this question of recovery from the crisis for the professionals is really a central issue. We finished our. Uh, 
of work about IPV DICOVID with what is put on the next slide, which is at the end of the conclusion of our report about this question of recommendations. Somehow, I will not address all those recommendations. I would prefer to only present, I would say, three points which are, I think, important. First, uh, that is upon five, eight, and eleven. Five is how do we ensure that we have an appropriate care for the most vulnerable groups? Most vulnerable groups are groups that usually are not really being taken care of specifically. They can survive, you know, within our society at the border of society, but during a crisis, then it's not possible anymore. And so, how do we address this specific issue, which are very difficult to frame because professionals are not used? to intervene with these groups. So more attention should be done out of the crisis, before or after a crisis for those groups. A second point is that uh, we need to also think about this health crisis by using a public health approach, which means we should take an account, of course, the most vulnerable groups in the diversity of the local context, which means that you could have, you know, um, what, whatever is the, the context of those vulnerable groups is having a very much high impact relatively on those groups and on, we we'll say, uh, on those groups and have to be considered in detail. And there the professionals need to have support because some of those vulnerable groups need really much more mean to uh, give them help. And then the last point is somehow, how do we provide with, uh, you know, NGOs as working, we know with, we call it the boot ficelle, we say, huh? and during the crisis, they really try to uh, address a uh, difficult issue with this boot ficelle, but somehow they use also them boot ficelle, and it, which means that how can they have enough resource to try to recover from the crisis by debriefing what had been done. So supporting debriefing was not provided by the uh, netter, by the health node, by the social ministries. So nobody thought about this question of caring for the carers out from the uh, healthcare system. So I think this is important to address that because we know the wealth of our NGO system and networks which are supporting this kind of uh, problems like IPVs. So I think that is the end of the talk. Great. Um... <clears throat> Thanks very much, Katerina and Charlotte. Um, it was a very nuanced overview of the issue of intimate partner violence, as well as how the impact, how the crisis has impacted both caregivers and policymakers, and how that creates attention. So thanks a lot. Uh, I'm afraid we we're going a little bit over time. So if, for the interest of keeping the timing as close as the original scheme as possible, I would suggest people that have a question to put those in the chat. Uh, normally, you can find the chat um, on the lower part of your um, WebEx um, window, uh, on the bottom right part. Uh, so, I would invite Charlotte and Catherine to answer the questions there. Then, going over to our next speaker, uh, our second presentation is titled Gender Analysis of Belgian Recovery and Resilient Plans, and it's held by Dr. Lorraine Till. And Lorraine has a PhD in economics, and she's currently a senior researcher at HIVA at KU Leuven, which is the Research Institute for Work and Society. She's currently working on uh, quality of work and social dialogue, and her focus is specifically labor market analysis and gender equality. So, Lorraine, I would invite you to share your presentation. Yes. Yeah, does yes. it work? Yes. Yes. We see the slides perfectly. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I will try to be as quick as possible and to present what um, we worked on um, actually last year and also starting in 2022. Um, so it was a project um, funded by ICV, so a union here in Belgium. And this project uh, had two parts. So the first part of the report and of the project was an online and paper questionnaire, a survey that was distributed to um, union representatives. And the, the main goal was to see if there were a um, differentiated impact of COVID-19 on female workers and on male workers. Uh, it was distributed in, in um, six key sectors. Um, 
Unfortunately, it was distributed to union representatives and not workers themselves. So that's why for this presentation, I would rather focus on the second part of the project, um, which was the gender analysis of the Belgium uh, resilience and recovery plans. Um, I will present both national and um, regional plans. So yeah, the project started in February 2022 and ended uh, last year in, uh, in April. So if you already probably knew, uh, in July 2020, um, nearly a 2,000 billion package was uh, voted at the European Union. The main goal during the COVID was to really all countries agreed to invest in the future, uh, especially in projects linked to climate protection and the digital revolution. Um, each country had to create and to yeah their own um, national and also in the case of Belgium, regional plans um, to explain what projects, what reform will be funded by this huge European fund. What we did in this uh, report is that we, we analyze all those four plans, so the three regional plans and the national plans for Belgium. What we did, we did here is to check whether these plans um, took into account or not possible differences um, between women and men, uh, especially regarding the COVID-19, not only uh, for the climate protection and digital revolution. So what we did is that we check, first of all, if women were cited or if gender analysis or gender as words were uh, included in the plans or not. And when it was done, if it was actually just mentioned or if it was clearly explained how to really calculate and take into account um, differences or not between men and women. So I will present now the different plans that we analysis. We really only an analyzed how it was written, okay? So not really how it was implemented, because now it's been two years, but really at the first phase, uh, how it was written. And uh, you will see, especially for the national plan, who was invited to, to write those plans. So first of all, for the Wallonia recovery plans, so it's a 7 billion euro uh, plan with uh, over 300 projects. Um, it's a really huge plan. So what Wallonia did is that it was, these plans had to be written uh, during the pandemic. So they had to, um, yeah, uh, the different the, the person in the region had to write uh, what would be funded related to climate change, to digital transformation, to um, plans that could be a project that could be useful for Wallonia. And so what Wallonia did is that they gathered together existing plans already in the area of digital transformation and, um, and, and green transition. Uh, when you look at the plan, so it's, if I remember well, 200 or 300 pages plan. Um, so it's really a lot. Um, and when you look at it, several sections or several projects explicitly mention women as a target group, or they mention really directly the gender dimension in the project or in the reform. So I, I wrote here, I selected here a few examples for, for instance, in one project, uh, the gender di dimension um, was a cross-cutting element in the fight against gender stereotypes in education and in career guidance. So to really at the very early age, not to um, um, in a way um, choose different um, jobs, especially for women or especially for, for men. Um, in one program, um, the aim was to reduce the digital divide between Walloon men and women. And women here were directly cited as a target audience, a target public for this project. So to really let women um, um, give training uh, for women, and especially old women, uh, on um, how to use digital tools, how to use computers. And a uh, last project, for instance, was to finance directly gender related action uh, and to encourage women to enter the construction sector. Looking now at the Flemish resilient plan, so it was a totally different story compared to the Walloon plans to analyze because this plan was actually very succinct. So it was over 30 pages. 
Um, and as it was really succinct, was not really a surprise, but the gender dimension was really absent from the plan. Um, the, the terms, for instance, women or gender do not appear directly uh, in, the, in, the, in the document. Um, but if you read actually between the lines, you can see possible indirect effect that women uh, could benefit from certain programs or certain plans. Uh, for instance, it's written in the plan that um, the money they would get through this uh, plan um, would help, um, would imply better remuneration and lighter workloads for healthcare staff. And we know that the majority of healthcare staff are women. So even though they are not directly cited, indirectly, they could actually benefit from this plan. Um, also in the plan, uh, it's written that a stronger approach to domestic violence um, uh, should, um, should, be, um, should be in place. Uh, and we also know that uh, women are also the majority of the victim of domestic violence. And finally, some support um, is uh, indicated for uh, to help vulnerable group to go digital and women can be uh, a, a, a target group here. Um, so I will discuss this afterwards also, but what we can already see here uh, is that so first, first of all, women or gender is not directly mentioned. OK, but uh, apart from that, even if it was like for the first Walloon plan, then we also need some um, figures or some clear indicator to actually, after the money is distributed, see if it was useful or not, uh, see if it was uh, see, see if it was correctly used, see if actually women benefited from those plans. And here, for instance, for the Flemish resilient plan, uh, it's already already be blurred. We don't really know if it's really for women or not. But um, for instance, better remuneration or lighter workloads for healthcare staff, then we don't know how to measure it. Better remuneration could be done. Lighter workload, we don't really know with which indicator. Uh, it's not clearly written that we should measure or count how many women, how many men, the different type of jobs that, uh, that would benefit from it. Um, so yeah, and I will come back to this at the very end. The last regional plan, so the Brussels Capital Regions Recovery and Redeployment Plan, is also quite short compared to the Walloon plan. Uh, but here, um, it did quite a good job uh, in terms of integrated agenda dimension. And it includes a number of measures to promote uh, equality between men and uh, women and men. Um, first of all, for instance, gender equality is cited in the first pages, if I remember well, as one of the cross-cutting objectives for all measures. So. Even if it's about um, yeah, green transition program or reform, um, pe uh, the, the people that will receive the money or the institution that will receive the money, the NGO, should always have in mind that um, gender equality should be one of the objectives. That being said, it's great, it's written, um, but it must be also uh, accompanied with indicators uh, for monitoring gender equality objectives. Uh, it's written like this, but we don't have any further details on which indicator, uh, what should be actually measured here. Uh, so it's good that it's written, but then, yeah, if you receive this plan, you don't really know how to do. And as a researcher, um, it's quite frustrating because then you have gender equality is cited, you see that it's important, at least that they thought about it. Uh, but then I'm really afraid that after all, so now or in the years to come, when we will really analyze uh, the actual impact of those plans, that we will lack actually measures or indicators, because first of all, it was not thought that it was not mentioned when the plans were created. And I will have the same actually um, discussion for the national plan. And it's my last plan to, to, to describe here to detail. So the next gen Belgium is now the national recovery and resilience plan. So it's not, um, it's not that they took the three regional plan, put it all together, and then that's the national plan. They use actually ideas and uh, some reforms from the different national plan, uh, regional plan, but they also added new things that they wanted to do at the federal uh, level. 
Um, so it's a nearly 6 billion uh, plan with uh, a bit more than 100 investment and 35 reforms. Um, the clear objective of, of the Belgian plan was to support climate um, objectives for 50% of the plan and nearly 30% of the plan should support the digital transition. Once this plan was written, uh, it was um, sent to the Belgium Institute for Equality of Women and Men. So they already uh, did an analysis of the Belgium, um, the national plan. So I will uh, here present some, um, some um, conclusion that they indicated in their report. Um, so the investment here in the uh, next gen Belgium uh, are mainly directed towards male dominated sectors. Um, so if you look at the objective, climate change, digital transition, this can be linked to a uh, construction sector, energy, STEM, ICT, and so on. So these are sectors that are already male dominated. And if you invest even more in those sectors, we can think that in the short term, this will exacerbate actually inequalities between men and women on the labor market. Um, it was in the plan from the Belgian Institute for the Equality of Women and Men, it was written that approximately 18% of the investment will have a positive impact on gender equality and that 52%, so a bit more than half of it, could have a potential positive impact on gender equality. If you look at the longer term, some investment, some program in the next gen Belgium uh, could actually contribute to gender equality, but not in the short run, but in the longer term. Um, I have here some example. Um, I will not cite everything, but for instance, um, it's written that um, they will create new childcare uh, facilities or places for, for more children. And this could in indeed increase, uh, improve women's access to the labor market and then indeed benefit gender equality at the end. Um, it was also written that uh, some project aims to digitalize public administration. At, at first, you might not really know how it is really linked to uh, gender equality. Um, but what is really important here, especially for us, for researchers, is that if you digitalize public administration and you think about it in advance, you can already plan that uh, some data will be gender disaggregated um, so that it will be easier to get um, anonymized data about women and the difference between men and women. Um, for the conclusion here, for the different plans that were analyzed in our report and uh, in the analysis done by the um, by the um, sorry by the Belgium Institute for the Equality of Women and Men, um, we can see that all those plans are quite ambitious, uh, inter uh, with varying degrees of gender mainstreaming. You know, as you as you as I presented, for instance, in the Flemish part women or gender was not mentioned at all. Um, but the thing is, and I already explained uh, that those plans will only have a real impact uh, in the field if the um, results of the measures in place can be measured um, accurately and disaggregated by gender um, so that we can actually really monitor and see the effect afterwards. Uh, the European Commission has set up two monitoring tools um, once all the, the, the countries have uh, sent their plans. So they created a specific tag assigned to each measure, social measure focusing on gender equality, so that when they will write specific report on gender equality expenditure, it can be easier to see. And they also uh, created 14 indicators common to all member states to track how the money was spent. Um, unfortunately, over those uh, 14 indicators, only four are already broken down by gender. So my main conclusion here is that, and we will see now that we can start analyzing the first um, impact or the first, how the money was really spent a couple of years after the plans were written and adopted. 
is that those plans, first, when they were written, already lack uh, measurable indicators, quantifiable indicators. So it will be really difficult to monitor afterwards and to evaluate if it really had an impact on gender equality. One solution could have been to use more um, systematically when those plans were written, a gender budgeting uh, approach in order to integrate the gender perspective into budgeting process. It's not that uh, you should always divide between men and women, but the fact that you don't even think about it is, is the problem. And we, uh, at the end of the report, we also emphasize the fact that if they are invited at the table to write those plans, uh, then unions can have a crucial role here to ensure um, that those plans have uh, an impact on, on gender equality. Thank you. That's all for me. Great. Uh, thank you, Lorraine, for this very interesting overview of this mosaic of Belgian policies regarding gender. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but again, I invite you to send your questions via the chat and Lorraine will uh, answer them there. Our next presentation is uh, led by uh, Dr. Federica Rossetti. Uh, she has a PhD in social sciences and she is currently working at the Cancer Center at Cienciano. Until recently, she worked in our service, Health Information, on the project Resistere. And this is a project on the impacts of COVID-19 policies on gendered and intersecting inequalities. So, Federica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. And in it, I will also try to uh, stick to my 10 minutes uh, time slot. So uh, I hope you can see my presentation well. And indeed, as Laura introduced, I will present some results from uh, Resistire project, uh, specifically focusing on intersectional approach that we used during the project. So uh, just to give some background, information about the project. The project uh, started in uh, April 2021 and it lasted until last September. And the consortium was made uh, by 11 partners from nine countries. Uh, the project had two main objectives. So the first objective was to understand the impact of COVID pandemic on behavioral, social and economic inequalities. Uh, using a gender plus framework and this framework means that we looked at the intersection of gender inequalities with other uh, inequalities based on different individual characteristics such as age, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, ethnicity, sexuality, disability. And the second objective was to design, devise and pilot policy solutions and social innovation uh, which could be deployed by policymakers and other stakeholders in different policy domains. Uh, here you can see the methodology uh, that we used in our project, uh, which is a cycle. And uh, we repeated the cycle three times in the whole period of the project. Uh, so the first part of the cycle uh, was an innovative way to uh, combine three types of uh, different type of research. Uh, a first uh, policy mapping of uh, policy of recovery, uh, including also recovery plans and uh, quantitative indicators of European and national surveys uh, collected during the pandemic, but also a qualitative analysis uh, and qualitative research uh, analyzing individual narratives. And all this research led some, brought some insights, which led to the second part of the, to the second part of the, of the cycle, uh, the co-creative co-creation or creativity, which was based on uh, the open studio. So we did um, a number of uh, action oriented workshops of two days uh, with researchers and other uh, actors active in the field of the topic we selected. And the workshops were really oriented to produce concrete solutions, uh, which was then uh, the second, uh, the, ter the third and the last part of our cycle and uh, solutions then uh, led to the production of different types of outcomes. Uh, in specific, particularly, we produced uh, three research agendas, uh, 21 policy recommendations in the form of fact sheets, uh, nine pilot actions, which were funded by the project. And uh, we did also some advocacy and dissemination activities of our results. For example, we had 
different webinars and also some uh, scientific publications. All the results are available on, from, on our website, which I can share with you uh, later. So now, before going into the results of the project, uh, I would like to give you to introduce the, the concept of intersectionality. So the term was um, used um, by Crenshaw at the end of the 80s. Uh, for the first time, she uh, analyzed, so she used it to, uh, to indicate, uh, to describe how uh, different characteristics, individual characteristics such as gender, race, uh, class and other, characteristic intersect and they overlap. And in particular, in this article that you can see here uh, on the slides, she used three legal cases uh, from the context uh, where at, at that time, uh, so in the US, uh, to show how black women uh, were discriminated, uh, not only because they were women, but also because they were black. And the combination of gender and race, uh, so not only gender and race, so they were discriminated because of the combination of the two led to uh, an, an, in, an, an additional layer of discrimination. And what we did in our project was, so in Resisire, we used this uh, concept of intersectionality to look at how different groups um, within society had been disadvantaged during the pandemic. So specifically with uh, the focus of gender and how gender interacted with other characteristics to lead to more uh, disadvantage. So now as an illustration of the concept of intersectionality, uh, we can see here some insights from the quantitative analysis that we did. And in particularly, we, uh, we analyzed data from Eurofound, Living, Working and COVID-19 uh, e-survey which was collected uh, right after the outbreak and for different for different rounds so we had the analysis that we did uh, we did different analysis um, looking at the uh, the differences between uh, four groups and using the intersection of two individual characteristics uh, sex and education in this case uh, we only we are not we didn't look only at uh, at the area of health so we had a lot of other indicators that we looked at, but today I would like to focus mostly on health. And so here we see that uh, looking at the whole, at the period of the pandemic analyzed here, we observe a, a steep climb in the percentage of respondents who rated their health as bad or very bad, uh, which which uh, leads to um, to think that the pandemic seems to have made everyone worse off no matter the sex or no matter the educational level. But we see, we do observe actually a gap and the gap is between the lower educated, so women and men uh, versus the higher educated ones. So the lower educated is reported to, uh, to feel worse during the pandemic. And another indicator that it's uh, important, that was in, really important in, centrally in our, in our project actually, and it's related to to well-being, it's a resilience. Uh, here we specifically looked at one question asking uh, whether people struggled with facing the, the problems in their lives. And here we also see somehow an increase uh, throughout the pandemic, but especially for women and particularly for lower educated women, which seems to have uh, faced problems uh, in ability to face their problem was uh, really high. Um, even even though there was a gradual recovery from the pandemic, so in the last part of the of the, the sp in spring 2022, they were still reporting to have uh, problems in uh, in facing uh, problem in facing problems. Uh, so one challenge that we faced in our uh, quantitative analysis was the possibility to perform uh, intersectional analysis or detailed uh, analysis with the available data because uh, data on sexuality and gender remain largely lacking uh, in large-scale European survey. And uh, so this makes the experience of the most vulnerable largely unobservable. And as a consequence, we can see that policy and research are kind of less reactive to the needs of the whole population. 
So what we could do in our project was to integrate the quantitative analysis with qualitative analysis. And this analysis allowed us to look at the most disadvantaged groups in terms of intersection of multiple characteristics, which leads to that to be for them more disadvantaged. And we also were able with the project to produce some outcome, uh, some action oriented outcomes, which tried to address intersectionality and, uh, and gender plus inequalities. The first outcome that I would like to show you today is one of the policy recommendation and in particular the fact sheet on uh, more intersectional data in which we proposed some solutions to um, address the problem of data availability and intersectional analysis. And uh, the, our suggestion is to develop a common European framework for the collection of social demographic data, but we also systematically collect and report data on sex and gender identity. And lastly, to promote intersectional analysis even within the statistics that we have uh, already. So the second outcome that I want to present today is one of the pilot action called uh, Amlight Employers, which was implemented by uh, the organization SOS Racismo, uh, based in the Basque country, Spain. And so the idea of the pilot action stemmed from the recognition that uh, working condition of a specific group of worker uh, in the area of domestic care was neglected during the pandemic. So this group were mainly uh, women with uh, background with a migrant background, a migrant origin. And the project objective was was to uh, raise awareness among the employers and the right of the rights and the needs of this uh, type of workers or so domestic workers, but also to to try to 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 find together uh, solutions to ensure quality care in decent conditions. So what the project was able to create was a, a safe space for the dialogue between domestic workers and employers, which uh, led to an opening of a public service for uh, to as a facilitation for between the two groups. And also the, the, the organization organized um, an awareness raising campaign uh, to um, to to present the project results uh, to the public and other stakeholders. So to conclude, um, we so with the project we um, we claim that policy making processes should include an intersectional gender plus perspective, and in particular we in particular we um, we emphasize the, the importance of uh, civil society organizations in this and this policy making process because these organizations are really in close contact with the most disadvantaged groups in terms of uh, intersectionality and intersectionality then should be promoted both in data collection and, and data analysis. That's it. Thank you for uh, the, for listening to the presentation and if you have um, if you want to refer to our outcomes, and uh, you can always have a look at our website. Many thanks, Federica. That leads us to the end of this webinar, and we have the closing remarks uh, held by uh, Dr. Hildegard van Hove. I'm very happy to welcome her in this webinar session. Um, Hildegard has a PhD in social sciences, and she's currently coordinator uh, of gender statistics at the Belgian Institute for equality of men, women and men. She has a wide array of expertise in all things related to gender equality, and I'm very happy that she's here today to share her insights. So Hildegard, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I, will, I will keep to the five minutes. Um, so the closing remarks, um, everybody uh, remembers how probably vividly how bad the, the sense of crisis was uh, during pandemic and also at that time, everybody was already aware that the effects were not um, distributed uh, equally, that there was a lot of difference between people on how bad they were affected by the crisis. And because of the segregation on the labor market and uh, the unequal division of care work, it could be expected that, that there should be a, a, gender, a gendered effect of uh, COVID. But I'm not sure everybody also still remembers how even the early days of the pandemic, uh, people sometimes were very hopeful that uh, the society would, that we as a, as a whole, would learn from the experience and, and, 
and get uh, and get out better, uh, like more equal, stronger, uh, more more sustainable, more just. So <laughs> the question is, did that work? Now we already have data; we can study this. And the first conclusion, very important conclusion, is it's not a one-dimensional world. Uh, gender should be studied in combination with other factors, such as educational background, profession, income, even quality of housing, things like that. So an intersectional approach is needed and, um, and with specific attention to vulnerable groups. It's a, a, result, re, a, resu a result that uh, comes from different uh, sources uh, uh, time and time again. And it's, it's, it, I really like this project because uh, it, it includes these uh, groups in the research and in the policy. Um, so there's a need for a fundamental increase. In general, you could say as a conclusion, there should be more respect for care work in general, for care workers, for social workers. And actually, the lack of this respect is a form of sexism. And it should not only be an applause, but it should be wages, better working conditions, and so on. So that's um, a lesson learned for the future. If we want a better future, this is what we need to do. We call this, this vital, uh, essential uh, uh, functions, uh, but we should also change our mindset uh, to it. Then a second conclusion is, um, did the crisis result in more attention to intimate pa partner violence? Yes, that's a good thing. Yes, <laughs> it's one of the central things of the uh, central points uh, that the Institute works on. So it's, it's good that there's more attention, um, but, uh, and there's a big but, and, and the, the, the contribution is really nuanced on that point. Uh, there's no evidence for a real a big increase. Um, so what we see is, uh, you could say, yeah, there will be the, there was a need for connection. People were alone at home. There was a need for empathy. I would say there was also a, to, a need to look for a bad guy and to implicitly say protest against this staying at home is not only good. Look, uh, look what can happen. Uh, but yes, what we also take is that stress as such is an important factor in intimate par partner violence. Uh, when there's a situation where it's already going wrong, then a stress situation like a lockdown uh, can, can make it uh, worse. So we're, we're happy with the attention and we are aware that there is a lot to it uh, uh, that, that explains that attention. And the third important conclusion is uh, what happened with the money. <laughs> so the European Union decided on a large sum to invest in the future. And we will want an enormous economic crisis that would normally would be a, a, a conclusion of a pandemic like that. So in order to prevent this, we're going to invest in the future. But is this future gender proof? So we had an anal analysis um, and uh, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, the conclusion should be uh, gender equality is not yet aut an automatic reflex. Uh, it should be, but it isn't. And we, we could expect this from money that comes from the EU that this this should be required. Um, it is mentioned, uh, some do better than others, but it, it's not an automatic reflex. And even at the EU level, uh, the indicators to monitor, monitor this progress are, are actually insufficient. Um, and what we often can say, what I would say is there is a lack of imagination. Uh, what world do we want to live in in 20 years when we think of the future? We should not think of tomorrow, not only think of tomorrow, but think uh, in a further way, and there I, I can see there's an uh, uh, we should have the audacity to aim high and uh, to ask for more. For and a bit the problem is that people assume that the equality that exists today will exist uh, in 20 years, which is not not necessarily the case. We can see um, evolutions going the wrong way, and on the other end, and also we should uh, dare to imagine a better world, a much better world, and, and work on that. And, and it's also related to uh, care work, like if you want um, well-being, what, what is well-being? That is when care is well organized and, 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 and is there for everybody, also the vulnerable groups. So if you have projects that's, that uh, help women go uh, leave a care work and go for better paid jobs elsewhere, that's not, uh, not enough imagination for what we need. We need a better... A better society is also a better um, um, 
yeah, a more e more equal society in our not only between women and men, but also between in our heads what what is what we imagine as femininity and masculinity. Uh, these types of um, of these types of uh, things a society needs uh, in order to be uh, a, 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 a nice place to live uh, for everybody. Thing. And uh, thank you everybody for the very inspiring uh, contributions. Yes, indeed. Uh, I found inspiration in each one of the speakers. So thanks a lot for an hour well spent. I, I also fully uh, applaud all of the different calls for a need for better data and more intersectional analysis. I know that's something that our service health and information is also, feels also very strongly about. So thanks a lot to all of the speakers for underlining that point. Uh, I also found it very interesting, the call for the need for measurable objectives and the, the talk about a crossover for science and action or the field. So those were also very interesting points for me to hear about. So I want to finish to, by thanking all of the different speakers and to all of the different participants for listening. Uh, we will share the recording of this webinar on our project web website if you want to um, have another look at it, as well as the slides from each of the presenters. So thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.